I want to thank uh, Dr. Pate especially for inviting us to give this opportunity to talk um, about our work. And Dr. Chikizik and I were just talking about uh, doing some uh, cross-coast studies where in Phoenix, which is about 90 already uh, today, uh, he's going to come out in February, January, December, and I'm going to head there in July and August. So um, hopefully we'll figure something out. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, so hopefully, uh, I'll do two things. One is, is stay on time, uh, Sarah. Um, and the other thing is, is go through this outline, uh, talking about building the, the conceptual case for physical activity exercise in youth who are already overweight or obese. Uh, show some experimental data on, uh, that supports exercise uh, in this population. And then what can we do in terms of translating the research findings into practice and potentially into policy and, and hopefully where we should go as a uh, scientific audience in, in terms of the future. So the conceptual cases, uh, Wing and Hills showed quite a bit of time ago that long-term successful weight loss is possible, but it's challenging. And if you def define successful weight loss as at least 20% uh, of their initial body weight that individuals can keep off for up to a year, uh, sorry, 20% uh, of individuals are successful at losing weight and keeping it off for a, up to a year. Uh, and that is defined as a, a weight loss of initial about 10%. Um, and again, physical activity is a, is a primary driver of those individuals who can be successful in terms of long-term weight loss. Um, but the rest, in terms of the 80% who do not, are not able to lose weight and keep it off over the course of the year, um, tend to regain that weight and it becomes a vicious cycle. And there's new data out that supports that it's weight cycling that has a, a deleterious effect on health outcomes and organs damage. So that message of you need to lose weight, well, you need to lose weight if you can keep it off. But if you're gonna gain it back, you're probably better off not losing weight in the first place. Um, most youth who are obese will remain obese for the rest of their life. So by the time you're 14, 15, or 16, if you're already an adolescent who's overweight or obese, you tend to track into adulthood with obesity. Um, and pediatric obesity is, is highly heritable. So there might be a genetic predisposition, especially early on in life. Uh, when you're talking about that early age group, zero to two, where data show that about eight to 10% are already considered obese, uh, that screams that there's some biological drivers in this, in this population. Um, and Ulf uh, just published a paper earlier in, in January uh, showing that PA uh, is protective against morbidity and mortality, and, and this protection is actually on, uh, independent of obesity, where if you took a physically inactive individual and moved them into the activity category, they have a much uh, lower mortality rate than if you take an obese individual and move them into the healthy weight category. And I hope my interpretation of that was, was close enough. Um, but suffice it to say, the conceptual case is long-term successful weight loss is a challenge. Most obese youth are gonna remain obese for the rest of their life. And PA, or physical activity, is protective against morbidity and mortality independent of whether you lose weight or not. So what's the role of exercise or physical activity in health promotion and disease prevention among youth who are already obese? So that's what I'm gonna cover here. But what I'd like to show you is, is uh, data that's about 10 years old now, uh, and it's a review article that looked at uh, exercise-only interventions in youth who are already obese. And I'm gonna focus the, oh gosh, hopefully, did I get this right, Andrew? Perfect. Um, focus on the squares here, because these are the mean averages of changes over the four studies that were reviewed here. And what you see here is this first uh, pictorial is change in body weight. and what. That shows that with exercising, anywhere between uh, two to four months, two to five months of, of exercise, obese youth will actually gain weight. So we have to think about the context of what was presented earlier today in terms of obese youth growing. So you're going through an exercise program and gaining weight. Well, does that mean that you're not addressing obesity? Well, when you look at the change in fat-free mass, and all these studies use DEXA uh, to look at changes in fat mass and fat-free mass, you see that that weight uh, gain is associated with an increase in fat-free mass and a slight but uh, significant decrease or change in fat mass. So the context of this is, is weight is probably not a good marker in terms of exercise interventions for youth who are already obese because they're continuing to grow and their body composition changes that might be associated with the exercise might be beneficial. So we need to think about these outcome measures. And again, this is an older uh, review, but a new uh, meta-analysis that came out looking at over 300 studies basically found the same thing, where they saw significant reductions in percent body fat, uh, but no other measures of adiposity. And those included BMI-related measures, body weight, or even central adiposity as a measure uh, of waist circumference. Um, none of those were statistically significant in terms of looking at youth who are already obese and going through an exercise training program. 
So we have to think about what outcome measures are meaningful, and I think uh, Dr. Chris did a great job of, of pointing to who are we working with and what is the best outcome measure in terms of health. And, and weight or weight loss, especially in a growing population of children or adolescents, is probably not our best outcome target. So what are these outcome targets that we could think about in, in looking at proximal measures of disease, proximal measures of disease risk that are going to be meaningful to the population? And, and we think about cardiometabolic health, which is cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes kind of combined. When you look at the uh, population level, number of, of children or adolescents who are already obese, about 30% of them have the metabolic syndrome, or constellation of risk factors that places them at risk for, the metab uh, for cardiometabolic disease later in life. Those individuals have a 25 times odds ratio increase for having a cardiovascular event in adulthood. And you look at uh, type 2 diabetes, data from the CDC published about 10 years ago suggests that as many as 50% of youth born in the year 2000 will develop type 2 diabetes in their lifetime. So this is a compelling argument for us to think about, not necessarily weight loss in this population, but improvements in health outcomes. Unfortunately, when you look at the data, and these are all recent meta-analyses that looked at the effects of exercise alone on populations who are already overweight or obese, so youth who are already overweight or obese, you see that uh, the data on blood pressure don't show a very positive effect. Well, I think it's important that we take an effect just because you're an adolescent who is overweight or obese, specifically an adolescent who is obese, doesn't mean you have hypertension. So is your blood pressure going to get better if it's already normal? Um, and when you look at these studies, the small effect sizes in blood pressure, uh, lipid profile, and even measures of insulin resistance uh, don't suggest that exercise has a, a robust effect or a very large effect on these cardiometabolic outcomes. And so, again, that's not the message, uh, Dr. Pate, I promise, that's not my, my final message. Uh, I think what we need to kind of think about in populations who are much younger is, is these outcome measures are based upon clinical outcomes in adult populations. How relevant are they at looking at health and health promotion in a much younger population? Um, and I think we go to uh, what might be considered kind of th this new idea that there's an ability for exercise to protect the cardiovascular system that's way beyond what we see change in, in terms of clinical outcome measures or traditional clinical outcome measures. And uh, Mike Jenner and Danny Green published this paper and, and defined what's called a risk factor gap. And this risk factor gap basically states that exercise appear to be far more protective in terms of morbidity and mortality than changes in blood pressure, changes in lipids, and even changes in glucose. And so how do we explain that gap in the context of a pediatric population who we hope is going to live 40, 50, 60, and 70 years down the road? What's a change in LDL by one or two points? What's a lowering of blood pressure by five or 10 percent mean in terms of their long-term health outcomes? When we're not quite sure what that risk factor gap, ten, uh, what that risk factor gap really means in these younger populations. So this long subclinical or latent period between elevated risk and potential eventual disease may, may draw the conclusion that this risk factor gap is actually even broader in pediatric populations. And so what we should think about is what's the most ideal measure for looking at whether exercise in this population can promote health. And so I'm going to go through a couple of, uh, of studies, and, and I picked these studies because they have interesting outcome measures, interesting populations, or interesting modalities, uh, and, and talk about what this approach might mean in terms of the context of addressing an adolescent who's already obese. So this paper was published in 2010, and they wanted to examine the effects of a high-intensity interval training program. This was twice a week for 13 weeks uh, on cardiac function using uh, uh, resting and exercise echocardiog echocardiography in 10 obese adolescents, a very small population, albeit. And this is um, almost a proof of concept, but what they did is they did extremely high intensity, so 90% of VO2 max, four minutes on, four minutes off, four minutes on, four minutes off, for 40 minutes. And so we'll talk about a little bit uh, about what that exercise paradigm means. Um, but the important part here is they did a study population and compared it to an otherwise lean cohort. And so what you see here is here's the obese population of youth before, and here's the mean afterwards. And this is uh, stroke volume index, so an indication of how much uh, stroke volume or how, how much this heart is able to pump uh, in the context of uh, relative to their body size. And what you see is there's significant reductions in the youth who are obese before compared to a lean quote unquote control group. And after the intervention, stroke volume index significantly increases, and there is no statistical difference between the youth who are obese and the lean control group. Now there's tremendous variability within that population. This is in heterogeneity that Dr. Crisco was talking about. But it's important that we think about, okay, in essence, this is improving the function of the heart, 
without, uh, sorry, I won't get to the punchline, but this is, this is improving the function of the heart as measured by stroke volume index and a decrease in global strain. This is another indicator of myocardial deformation. So what you see here is very similar. This is baseline, this is after the invention, and this is the lean control group. Again, tremendous variability in the context of how they respond to exercise, but no significant differences after the intervention. In essence, this intervention normalized uh, myocardial function in this population. So a couple take home messages. Very small changes in fitness, statistically significant but small, about 8%. Zero change in weight, two times a week of physical activity, high intensity exercise. So the question is, is this feasible? Well, about 95% of the sessions were attended. And when you start to think about the context of, yes, you can go in and exercise for 40 minutes. Yes, it's a high intensity followed by low intensity interval training. Obese, obese kids actually tend to like this type of intervention more so than a continuous uh, exercise program. So their take home message here is that exercise can normalize mitocardial uh, dysfunction in otherwise, uh, what in, which we would quote unquote call a healthy obese population because there was no differences in lipid measures or blood pressure in these two groups and no changes in those markers. So another study looked at uh, uh, vascular function. So how well is the vasculature able to respond to shear stress? Uh, and they looked at the effects of a circuit training program three times a week for eight weeks on vascular function in 19 obese adoles or adolescents who were obese. And they measured endothelial function using uh, flow-mediated dilation, brachiarly flow-mediated dilation. And again, they used the same paradigm where they had lean control subjects, the uh, participants who were obese, untrained, and then after exercise training. And again, you say at baseline, there's significant differences between the lean and the obese kids. And then those uh, flow mediated dilation measures were normalized after intervention. Again, no changes in weight, no changes in, in traditional lipid values or blood pressure. Again, suggesting that exercise can improve vascular function, one of the earliest signs of atherosclerosis, without changing those traditional lipid measures uh, that you would take in clinic. Um, and then I'm going to show you some data that I published as a PhD student looking at the effects of resistance training on insulin sensitivity in, in overweight and obese uh, Latino adolescents. Um, so people always ask me, well, why are you doing resistance training in this population? Well, there's lots of reasons to do it from a, a metabolic perspective, but also from a psychosocial perspective. When you take this population, uh, they might be uh, aerobic exercisers that would be considered intolerant or their exercise intolerance. If you put uh, a classroom full of, of, of kids and adolescents, those kids who are asked to run the mile and end up last are always the kids who have higher weight. But you put those same kids in a, resist, uh, in a resistance training room or a strength training exercise, those kids are also the strongest kids. So we have an exercise paradigm that supports them being physically active in an activity or an exercise that they're good at. Um, and our outcome measures were insulin action or insulin sensitivity uh, measured by the FSIVGTD and body composition by DEXA. So two, two times per week for 16 weeks, all these kids were at least pubertal um, from a Tanner stage perspective. And what you see here in this slide is uh, the resistance training increased, the resistance training group increased their insulin sensitivity by about 45%. The control group had a very small increase. A couple things to take here is, is that this very small increase might be a function of kids going through puberty. So we have to take into account that puberty is associated with insulin resistance that is transient, that should, um, that should go away after kids go through puberty. Uh, and the other take home message here is, is these improvements were independent of any changes in body composition. No changes in weight. In fact, these kids increased their weight slightly, not statistically significant, but slightly. Again, these are obese boys who are lifting weights with lots of androgens. They're going to put on lean tissue mass. Subtle decreases in, in fat mass, but not statistically significant. Here's another thing that uh, we looked at, is we looked at the individual changes. Again, it's a small sample, so it allows us to look at these individual changes, but you see, again, tremendous variability in the response to really the same exercise training protocol. Uh, and most of these kids, 10 of the 11 kids, increased their insulin sensitivity as a function of this exercise training protocol. So one of the challenges is how do we translate this research into real world practices? Again, these are proof of concept, very small studies that allow us to look at uh, individual responses and suggest that exercise can improve health outcomes that are not typical health outcomes that you measure in clinic, but also health outcomes that are meaning to meaningful to cardiometabolic disease. But we wanted to adapt this and put this into a real world program. Um, and this is some data that uh, we developed in collaboration with the community organization, the YMCA and the community clinic, to develop a, a diabetes prevention program specifically for Latino adolescents who were obese. 
Um, and I'm going to spare you some of the details, but Suffice Today is a family-based program, but kids also work out in the context of other kids. So these are adolescents who tend to exercise in groups and social settings. So this really worked well, and the nutrition education was provided by lay health educators who are from that community, culturally grounded in a way they speak the language, they understand the community, understand the culture from which these families are coming from. So very different approach than the exercise training programs. Um, and I, I'm not going to spare you some of the details. We saw significant, statistically significant improvements in, in insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance as measured by an oral glucose tolerance test. But when you plot the individual responses, and here is uh, in, changes in insulin sensitivity, and these are these kids' individual responses to uh, the intervention. You see this group here actually decreased or did not change their insulin sensitivity in the context of this intervention, where these kids in, in green were those who saw increases in insulin sensitivity. You take this together, there's statistically significant improvements. But what differentiates those kids who respond to intervention, lifestyle intervention, from those kids who don't? No differences in reported nutrition, no differences in reported physical activity, no differences in, in, in fitness between these two groups. We had a PhD student who's, who's really interested in the molecular mechanisms of insulin resistance, and we did a, a very um, a shotgun approach. We took uh, blood samples from these kids to look at RNA gene expression. Very untargeted, hypothesis-generated approach. Wanted to see whether there were differences in genes between these two populations. And what we found is this group of, of kids who responded to the intervention had a, over a thousand genes that were significantly either upregulated or downregulated in response to the intervention. Again, untargeted, no hypotheses here. We just want to see what's changing. The kids who did not respond to the intervention only had about 120 genes that were significantly upregulated or downregulated. And they shared very few genes that were the same. So, again, no changes in behavior, no differences in behavior between these two groups. But we're starting to see that there's maybe some biological basis to wet kids, how they respond to lifestyle intervention. And the context of that is many of the clinicians that I work with say, you know, I tell my kids to exercise more. I tell my kids to eat right. And they come back and their weight hasn't changed. So they must not be doing what I'm telling them. OK, that's one way to look at it. But the other way to look at it is maybe there's a biological system that's in place. And they say, well, OK, well, I'll measure their, their, their lipid levels. I say, OK, well, lipid levels are probably genetically predetermined as well. I'll measure their A1C. A1C in kids means nothing. If you're type 1 diabetic, it means something. If you're already showing that you're diabetic, A1C means something. But A1C doesn't mean much in an otherwise healthy population. And I said to my clinicians who I work with, well, either way, the message isn't being received. Whether it's biology or they're not listening to you, let's try a different message. Well, these kids just don't listen. I said, well. Maybe it's the message that you're sending them that they're not listening to. Um, so thinking about this approach very differently than some of these kids are going to respond and respond well. Some of these kids are not going to respond. We need to understand what outcome measures are important in terms of that response and then target those kids, sorry, these kids here who are quote unquote not responding with a different approach. What is that other approach that might be meaningful for them? So since I have a little bit more time, I'll talk a little bit about how we translate this research into practice and policy. So I talked to you about um, the clinicians who I work with, encouraging them to prescribe exercise in clinical practice. What does that mean? Prescribe it the same way you would prescribe metformin. Give the kid a, a prescription pad and tell them what you want them to do. Well, I don't know what I want them to do. I said, that's one of the first problems. OK, we know what we want them to do. We want them to increase physical activity. How is the question? So we need to come up with better models. And how we do that, I think, is integration with community programs. So we now have partnered our clinicians with programs in parks and YMCA. So if a kid gets a prescription for physical activity from their pediatric endocrinologist, those kids will not pay uh, a, a rate at the community center. Or those kids will actually get to see a provider at the community center or an exercise specialist at the community center who knows what to do with that prescription. Uh, we need to incorporate some of this uh, behavioral change strategies, goal setting, role modeling, and social support. It's not just about pointing at that adolescent who's obese and saying, you need to do this. What family are they living in? Incorporating the parents into the, into the quote unquote prescription. Uh, and from a policy perspective, think about reimbursements, Incentives, not just for providers, think about incentivizing the kids, incentivizing the kids to be physically active. There's some new data that's coming out that it might not be such a bad thing to start incentivizing kids to be physically active and exercise. Uh, and whether that leads to ongoing support, I think the data are unclear yet, but also providing education and training for providers as well as our folks in the community who are seeing these kids and working with these kids on a regular basis. Uh, from a research perspective, 
We understand that exercise is medicine, and that's a, it's an important kind of approach that ACSM is taking, American uh, Medical Association is taking, but the pediatric component of exercise and medicine is yet still to be defined. Looking at targeted populations and using BMI alone is not sufficient. We need to move beyond BMI in terms of looking at what kids are at high risk. Maybe some metabolic outcomes might be better determined as saying this kid's at risk for cardiometabolic disease early on in life. Um, better outcome measures, more proximal to disease process. Again, lipids and blood pressure are meaningful and good when they're elevated, especially when they're elevated in adults. In children, we're not quite sure whether those are the best outcome measures. Uh, psychosocial health and emotional health seem to be one of the most important things to kids. Quality of life, they're way more interested in quality of life than their LDL cholesterol or their blood pressure. Um, optimizing our exercise parameters, I think this is our perspective from an exercise science approach, coming up with these dose response studies. And really, the next generation is using better designs. The randomized control trial of kids who are already obese, a control group, we know what's going to happen with that kid. So we need to move beyond just the control group. Um, and hopefully in the discussion, we'll share with you what's happening in our newer studies with the control population. So on that, thank you, appreciate it.